A pastor and a priest walk into a movie theater. Hi, I'm Father Andrew Miller. And I'm Reverend Michelle Byerly. And this is A Pastor to Priest Walk Into a Movie Theater, a podcast about faith, life, and the silver screen. Today we'll be discussing the 1999 fantasy comedy film Dogma. For those of you who have not seen it, we highly recommend it. We do acknowledge that it is um, an equal opportunity offender, and so therefore there's going to be things that you wrestle with that are uncomfortable. But we do recommend checking it out because it is some really... Um, good thoughts. As we get started, we're getting into this discussion around how seriously we take it or not. Yeah. Um, but I think it invites us to balance the comedy and and the layer of thought underneath the comedy that it invites us to. Yeah, it's funny. The very, very opening of the film is a disclaimer card, which uh, sort of lays out the, uh, uh, and I think it does so in a way that pokes fun at people who might be offended by the movie for one reason or another. And or I think litigious. It pokes, yeah, it, it pokes fun uh, at people who are offended. And, and, and then there's a sense in which, um, uh, and I don't agree with this, by the way, but there is a sense in which a lot of folks um, uh, make fun of people for, be, make fun of the act of being offended by something. Um, I, I, I think that's a misguided making, that's a misguided. Uh, uh, action to make fun of people for being offended. That's misguided because I think there are very good reasons for being offended. But um, uh, nevertheless, part of that card is the uh, uh, um, is Kevin Smith who directed the film inviting the viewer to not take the film so seriously. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure we can. I, I, I mean, for one thing, this this discussion, we're already we're already saying no to his invitation. We're taking the film seriously enough to talk about it. And also, I, I think you're right. I, I think whether or not Kevin Smith intends for us to take it seriously, it it is a serious film, uh, as as most of the great comedies really are. It, it's, it's agreed. The best comedies are often very deadly serious, and I think Dogma is is, is one of them. And and the last thing I'll say about taking something seriously is that one of the most um, one of the, the most basic and, 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 and important dogmas of the Christian faith is uh, in the beginning was language and language was with God and language was God. Language has power. And, and, and insofar as, as a movie is language and, and all language has the power to create, be, be creative or destructive, it's not possible to not take language seriously. Agreed. Um, and I think to, you know, getting into this notion of taking offense or not, um, generally speaking, it does follow a good rule of comedy that it punches up, not down. And I think this film does both. Fair enough. And, and I think that it is possible to call out the ways in which the film does both. There are ways in which the film is truly prophetic in its punching up. And there are ways in which the film is not so much, but because there are some places that are a little cringy by today's comedy, and it should be cringy. Um, the the notion that one should have to prove that they're not gay, as if being mm. gay was something to be avoided, is is a problem. And and the the I, I, the, the the way women are treated in in the film by at least one of the main characters. Um, and the, 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 what, what I would say, though, is, is that this, I cringe when someone tells me, why are you so offended? I mm. cringe when someone tells me, when someone decries cancel culture and political correctness. Because, um, as I said, language has power. It has destructive power. It has creative power. And, and, and at that point, uh, how we react to language is valid. And for, for better and for worse. And so the, the, to me, the discussion over whether or not uh, there should be a thing as what we might call political correctness or you know, setting boundaries around language, calling out uh, uh, certain usages of language or cancel culture, this notion of, of, of canceling or, or calling out and applying consequences to, to 
um, uh, language that punches down. Uh, the discussion is not over whether or not, uh, uh, the fruitful discussion ought not be, I should say, over whether or not those things should or should not exist. Of course they should exist. And, and the right has its, the, the, the political right and the social right has its own version of those things, whether they like it or not. In fact, this very film was protested by conservative Christians because it gave mm -hmm. offense to them. And, so and to fun fact, Kevin Smith himself Join attended them. some of those press tests mm -hmm. <laughs> to his great credit. But uh, and, and it's it, exactly. And, and, and so, you know, conservative Christians and conservatives in general have their own understand own version of, quote unquote, cancel culture, quote unquote, um, uh, uh, a political correctness. Uh, the question that we ought to debate is not whether or not these things should exist. Of course they should exist. It, it flows from the simple fact that language has power that they should exist. The question is whether or not we should apply them in a certain circumstance versus another circumstance. And that is a fruitful discussion, right? Is it acceptable for me to assert that we really shouldn't talk in such a way uh, uh, and, and under what circumstances? Yeah, which gets, you know, language is contextual too. Mm -hmm. You know, certain, like there is one moment where one of the, um, where the, the apostle <laughs> refers to Jesus using the N word. Well, and, and, and yet he has the privilege seemingly to do so. It, well, he's he's black. Mm -hmm. And I, I would assert that African-Americans have and ought have that that right yeah. <laughs> to use that word as they wish. <laughs> yeah. So um, the movie is called Dogma. And one of the big themes of the movie is moving from this place of being you know, having this very rigid understanding of faith to seeing it more as having a good idea where, you know, you, you, you have faith, but it's okay to wrestle with it. It's, and it's not so, so rigid. And so for me, one of the pieces of conversation that I think is good to have and is important to have with this movie is it invites us to think about the difference between having a doctrine having a dogma and being dogmatic where I think a doctrine for me just comes from the word teaching and it's, you know, it, we can have doctrines of the church. We can have, you know, here's kind of what our standard teaching is about faith. And we've wrestled with what those are versus what's not um, dogma, as you've said, is about having opinion, belief, and then being dogmatic for me is when you take that dogma to an extreme and, and you, again, it's that rigidity around it and that it, it feels like someone who's dogmatic, there is nothing that could be said that would ever get them to change that opinion and to change that belief and, or they might try to push that belief on others and say, if you don't believe as I do, you're wrong, you're going to hell and so on. Yeah, I, I think that um, dogmatism is um, condemned in the New Testament in the person of the Pharisees as Jesus encounters them, um, although that really isn't fair to the historical Pharisees. How, how the Pharisees we encounter in the New Testament is not the same, or not, they are not the same people as the Pharisees we encounter in history. In fact, actually, in some way, respects quite the opposite. But um, they're also condemned, I would argue, in the, or they are to be dogmatic is to be fundamentalist. Um, don't confuse the issue with facts. I know I'm right. Um, and um, I, the, the word dogma comes from the Greek word dokain, which means opinion. But in, in the context of the church, um, and I, 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 both of us being Trinitarian Christians, I, I think both of us share this, uh, although our traditions approach it a little differently. And um, my sure. tradition, um, uh, old Catholicism approaches it much different, well, slightly differently than the tradition that the film is poking fun at the most, i.e. the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but what dogma means is it is that set of doctrines that we have identified as being essential to the Christian faith, to assert uh, that one is Christian is to accept these dogmas, right? Um, now, uh, of course, we have two of our partners who do not accept at least one 
of the dogmas that are uh, set forth in the ecumenical councils. And I want to be very, very careful here. Um, now, I'm not going to apologize for the ecumenical councils because the ecumenical councils, and I'm, what I mean is I'm not going to defend them because the ecumenical councils are horribly problematic in so many ways, uh, as is the Bible itself. I, I'm not going to uh, attempt to defend the genocide that the book of Joshua enjoins because uh, genocide is always wrong and uh, radical exclus exclusionism is always wrong. Uh, dogmatism is always wrong, right? But these are part of our tradition. And, and, and I think part of the reason why I at least remain in the Orthodox Christian tradition, and I, I, I'm not going to speak for yourself, uh, I'm not going to speak for you, but the reason why I, is because I, I, I sort of allow myself to recontextualize these, um, these more problematic aspects to where perhaps they don't mean the same thing to me as they might have meant at another time. So for instance, um, what it means to have a dogma is to set boundaries, right? And, and every human person has the right to set boundaries. We talk about that often in a pastoral professional sense, right? Setting boundaries, setting personal boundaries and knowing when somebody that you're working with is violating those professional boundaries. Furthermore, um, the idea of saying, all right, this is what we Christians believe, right? does not mean that those who don't believe them are wrong or bad or going to hell. What it means is that they're just not Christians. And that's fine, right? We often hear that in a shame way, right? Because mm -hmm. fundamentalists have trained us to hear it in a shame way. We're Christians, we're right, we're going to heaven, they're not, they're going to hell, right? Mm -hmm. um, but actually, if I were to say to a Muslim, well, you're really just a Christian too, aren't you? And that, that Muslim might say, no, I'm not. What are you talking about? I'm a Muslim. Don't define me. Don't 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 violate my boundaries. So the act of setting boundaries in a positive sense. Now I seriously doubt this is what Saint Cyril of Alexandria had in mind. But well, fuck him. Um, but this is what I have in mind. Setting boundaries are, 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 as an Orthodox Christian allows me to to say, I am an Orthodox Christian. You are a Jew or a Muslim or a Hindu. You go yeah. be the best Muslim you know how to be, and I'll go be the best Orthodox Christian I know how to be, and we'll worship right. the divine together. It's about identity, right? It's about who we are. This is who we are. This is who we have, who we are not. Um, and I think part of it too, I think part of the challenge is, and maybe this is a bit of an oversimplification, There, there is a difference between faiths that are more about the orthodoxy versus orthopraxy. And Christianity is very much an orthodoxic faith, although we do have praxis that we claim, but there's a focus on belief and doctrine and teaching. And I think that's something fundamentalists have done to us and that we need to get away from it. Mm -hmm. Because and, and in fact, any good Greek Orthodox Christian, oddly enough, given their name, will tell you the opposite. Because the ancient Christian doc, the ancient Christian dictum goes lex orandi est lex credandi. In Latin, it means the law of prayer is the law of belief, and, or as we pray, so we believe. And by prayer, they mean encounter, right? Doctrine flows from an encounter with God in Christ Jesus, in the Christian sense, right? Everything we believe comes out of that very practical encounter. And, 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 and when one emphasizes the belief over the encounter, one has become a fundamentalist. And mm -hmm. I, I would actually say that that's not a recontextualization of the faith. That, that, that's exactly what the fathers of the church, problematic though they, they may have been, had in mind. That, and, and in fact, the seven ecumenical councils um, were what they were precisely because the quote unquote heretics were introducing um, teachings that conflicted with the worship experience of the church. For instance, the tradition of worshiping Jesus, the tradition, the tradition of calling Mary mother of God. Um, it, it is precisely these practical elements of the faith that the fathers of the church understood as being uh, under threat. And so uh, for them, the praxis was more important than the doxis. Of course, um, to separate praxi, praxis, practice, and doctrine um, is a very, very modern thing to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, 
it, it wouldn't have existed in that time. Mm-hmm. Because as you say, what you believe should be lived out and how you act. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you're right that we've kind of split those two because we've gotten to this place where we can say one thing and do a whole other Hmm. along the way. And that's part of why sometimes Christians get accused of being hypocrites Hmm. in the midst of things. So, um, yeah, so so beliefs give us identity. And what I find really interesting is kind of and this is kind of an invitation to start us into kind of going through some of the different characters of the story. The main character of the story is Bethany. She is, we don't know exactly what her role is, but we know that she works at a Planned Parenthood Mm -hmm. while also being a very devout Roman Catholic. Devout. Yeah. With uh, Andrew used some air quotes there. Um, She's definitely in this moment of wrestling with what she believes partly through, you know, why has how can she believe in a god that has allowed some of the circumstances that of suffering that she's dealt with which is a very common wrestling of faith right people are experience suffering and they're like okay where is god in the midst of this what do i believe about god how do i figure this out and it starts she's attending mass and they get up and they say the apostles creed which um I know you have some thoughts about that as well. They should say the Nicene Creed if they're at mass. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. Yeah. And so the there's difference in language there. And and the the creeds, again, were statements of faith that were wrestled with to create that orthodoxy, to say this is what is essential to belief as a Christian. And um, they're used in the baptismal formulas, they're used as we profess faith. And so she is wrestling with that and she moves from this place of having these, um, you know, she starts there. She, she kind of gets up and she intones the statement of faith in a very kind of dull rote way. And then she moves at the end to this place where she's had this experience of God and she is okay with saying, you know, I don't have all the answers and maybe it's enough to just have a good idea. I, 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 I have an idea of one God, the Father, all sovereign maker of heaven and earth, of all things mm-hmm. visible and invisible. Be interesting if we read the creed that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, and, and, and um, Bethany, um, the, the, the hero's journey for her is, is very interesting. Um, I, I would regard it as a kind of conversion experience uh, that, that, that spans the movie. Um, and and um, we, we, we encounter her in what Walter Brueggemann would call a state of disorientation. She's, she hasn't abandoned her faith. And as many of the psalmists like uh, um, Psalm 88 uh, uh, hasn't abandoned their faith, they're praying. But what is it that she says? I used to, I used to go to church and feel so powerful, or I, I don't remember how she put it. And feel alive, I yes. think is maybe how she said it. Yeah, and now it's it, and it's very clear, and it's and she's sitting in church with a bunch of people. I think one of them's playing video games. I think one of them's listening to music. I think everybody looks bored, and she just looks bored herself. And that and that's commented on so much for the course of the film about just how how boring um church has become for these people and 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 that's where she is and she's there not because it is boring so much as it is because she's experienced um a great deal of pain and trauma um she wanted to have a child um but couldn't for reasons and um uh, she's angry with god about that uh she's in a crisis of faith and she's found that the bumper sticker theology of her mother doesn't help. And, you know, speaking of that element of being angry with God, you know, so she gets this quest, if you will, that she's supposed to stop these two angels from going into this arch of plenary indulgence and thus negating all existence. And partway through, she finds out something about her identity 
that she is the however many great niece of Jesus. And that is the point that just she it it's the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, where she's just like, I I've had it with trying to figure this out. I'm it's it, I don't I don't want this anymore. I it's too much. And so she has this moment of um as you pointed out before she goes into the lake and it's a baptismal kind of moment slash conversion moment. Um, and then along comes the, the Metatron and we'll get into that conversation later, but it's one of my favorite scenes of the movie where she just has this moment of like raging about everything. Mine too. Um, it's a very interesting baptismal prayer. I fucking hate you. Mm-hmm. And and yeah no I of course presumably she was baptized as a Catholic however but no she she runs away when she learns that she is the last scion um, and falls into a lake and in the course of falling into the lake she's you know crying out at God I fucking hate you and that's when the Metatron appears and 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 to me his his soliloquy in that moment is just really beautiful and captures a a tension of that that that. <clears throat> really i i think any any non-dogmatic faithful person really needs to embrace and that is um he's he, he he's talking about when he first told the young jesus about his mission and the young jesus begs him to take it away begs him to not make it true which i think is absolutely what any young child would have done um and 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 the metatron who understands exactly what he's supposed to do who understands exactly what the plan is who knows exactly why the plan needs to be carried out this way nevertheless says if if i could have i would have i would it's not fair it's not fair for god to ask this young child to do this and if and even worse he the the that god can't even tell him can't even tell jesus god's self mm-hmm. because humanity doesn't have the psychological or oral or capacity to hear the voice of God, which is why the Metatron is that mediator. Mm-hmm. Which speaks to the, um, uh, the the concept of intimacy with God, which is such a, an important theme in the film. The, the fact that um, um, Bethany doesn't feel um, the sense of intimacy with God that she once did. The, the fact that in Bartleby's entire, the, the angel Bartleby, his entire conflict is is the fact that he 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 can't he he's lost his intimacy with God, um, and and there's a story behind that, and 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 then of course Jesus, who is God, um, he, he can't hear the voice of God, so and 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 no human being can, and so there's this sense of separation between human beings and God in in, in built into the very fabric of creation itself what Karl Barth yeah. might call the whole otherness of God. So you, you started talking about Bartleby and I want to, I want to move to him next. Um, and he and Bethany are sort of, they have similar parallel paths that they follow in their story where they're trying to figure out, you know, they, they feel like they've lost their faith each of them comes to um, their own places as they're wrestling with that. Bartleby, um, I, of course, the, the conflict begins um, several millennia before the film begins, when Bartleby and his angelic pal Loki are out for a drink after Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, Loki is the angel of death. His job is to carry out God's wrath and, well, kill people, um, sort of like Gabriel in our, our episode on the prophecy. Um, <clears throat> but um, so they're having this drink and, and the very, very passionate, deeply feeling Bartleby questions the idea of, of divine retribution as such, right? Um, and uh, the, the rectitude of, of, of killing people for God um, and convinces his friend, his friend Loki to, to give up his position as, as the angel of death. And apparently uh, the result is, is that they're cast out of heaven. 
Um, I actually have a different read on it, and we can get into that a little bit a little bit later. But I actually wonder to what extent were they cast out of heaven, or to what extent did they walk away? Um, and this gets into this notion that um, I, I think that the, the main characters, the angels, including the Metatron himself, are kind of getting it wrong. Uh, but that's 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 another issue. Um, so they're cast out of heaven. Um, and Bartleby is a very deeply feeling, very passionate, uh, very compassionate person, um, loves human beings deeply, felt sorry for human beings. And, and it, it is that compassion that gets him in trouble. And there's a very, very interesting way in which he is, he as the most compassionate uh, of the pair of Loki and Bartleby, that's what leads him into the great violence at the end. Because he feels he feels so hurt, he feels so abandoned, and 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 that leads him to 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 do to do great violence. Also, um, uh, talk about the resolution a little bit in Bartleby's character. Okay, yeah, let's go there. Well, yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the resolution in Bartleby's character because um, Bartleby and Bethany really, I think, come to a similar place. Um, they start in a similar place of having lost their faith. Uh, well, they have really haven't lost their faith, but they're in a in a crisis of faith. Um, but they they they're both very angry with God. Um, uh, they express their anger in different ways. But it is interesting to me that in the end, um, Bartleby comes face to face with God and finds forgiveness, which 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 speaks to which really undercuts the the very premise of the film, doesn't it? Because the very premise of the film is that if they if if they find forgiveness with God, if they walk through this this archway and and encounter the plenary indulgences, oh by the way, the movie's getting the doctrine of plenary indulgences wrong, and we'll get to that in a second. But if they walk through this archway and find forgiveness, then this proves somehow proves God um, to be fallible and therefore unmakes existence itself. But actually, I think, and and it's it's interesting how. God is off, is is out of the picture, and and the God character never expresses this, never says that this is the case. The Metatron says that this is the case. The Apostle says that this is the case. The Muse say that this is the case, and I think they're wrong. I I, I think that if they walked through that archway, they would have found forgiveness, and it would have been as Bartleby said in the very beginning of the film, eh, forgive and forget. In, indeed, that's. That's what would have happened because that's what did happen. God forgives him, and and and, and it speaks to me of how the movie is not just about uh, the transformation of Bethany. It's not just about the transformation of Bartleby. It's also about the transformation of all of the main characters into coming to see uh, ha- have a better picture of the character of God as someone who is not dogmatic, but as someone who is caring and, and loving. And, and and that's also why I say that yeah. at the end of the day, God never ca- never casts Loki. And and um, uh, uh, Bartleby out. They did that themselves by their misunderstanding of the character of God. They saw God as vindictive, and as such, they didn't have enough faith in God's mercy, so they walked away from God. Which is exactly what Adam and Eve did, isn't it? Yeah, and we still do today. Yes, they didn't have the faith in God to present themselves as sinners before God, so they hid. And as a result, God didn't kick them out of the garden. They experienced themselves as being kicked out of the garden. But in reality, they walked away from the garden. God never kicks them out. And had they presented themselves to God in faith, God simply would have done exactly as, as he did for, as she did for Bartleby at the very end, receive him with a hug. Agreed. Yeah, I, I, I think we should talk a little bit about i mean we, we talked about bartleby but what about the pair loki and bartleby so again i think this is where i pair them off versus jay and silent bob as a pair mm-hmm. um for me i very much see bartleby as the if i'm and i know i get sometimes i get these characters confused but if i remember correctly bartleby is kind of the the manipulator of the group of the two of them. They, they very much have a, what I would call a codependent relationship. Um, It's kind of played today. We would call it a bromance Mm. and there's even kind of some light made of that. 
similarly as there's light made of that kind of relationship with Jay and Silent Bob of being heterosexual life partners or whatever they term it. Um, But the difference is with Jay and Silent Bob, there's not one versus the other that's trying to drive things or try to push the other person beyond boundaries of where they're comfortable. Um, I would accuse Jay of doing that, but I think Silent Bob is just wise enough to not take his bullshit. Fair. So, um, yeah, so Jay and Silent Bob are what the movie called the prophets. (laughs) And, um, you know, that's even kind of an amusing play on um, terms for one, you know, because they they mention, you know, prophets in the sense of the P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. But then they talk about prophets of making a profit, making money, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I, I I don't think they're prophets. I think they're oracles. Because mm. um, because everything they, they they predict comes true, right mm-hmm. down to the uh, there's going to come a point in time at which you know we're five minutes from the end of the world and then we can have sex. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> it, it, it all comes true. They for for some reason Jay has this amazing clairvoyance. Yeah. Which isn't exactly prophecy per se, but go on. Yeah. So yeah, let's talk about, I wanted to talk about that. So prophecy is not, you're right that it's not an oracle. It's not predicting the future as it will be. Prophecy is about casting a vision of what might be if circumstances don't change, if there's not repentance of heart and And that that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. The, the mission of the, the ministry of the priesthood is to advocate um, uh, to God on the people's behalf. Uh, the ministry of the prophet is to advocate to the people on God's behalf. And um, I, I would say that you might be able to make the case that Silent Bob is prophet in that regard, which is very ironic given that he is, well, silent. Um, but uh, uh, I, I would say the two prophetic characters in that regard are the Muse and Rufus. Um, but uh, 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 yeah, Jay and Jay and Silent Bob are, are interesting. Uh, I, what do we make of Loki, though? You know, I, I, Loki's an interesting character because, you know, he is shaped by being tasked with this very difficult thing of what he perceives as God's wrath and God's violence. You know, being the angel of death is not an easy task for him it seems um and so he's kind of dealing with that he's also very rigid you know i i the for me i think of the the scene in the in the corporate headquarters of this um company that's supposed to kind of be um a play on a certain company that we're not going to say because they like to be slightly litigious but um (laughs) We've done some of their movies. Yeah. So, um, you know, but, you know, he's very rigid about the idolatry and the, you know, he goes around and he, he, his, he's very much about people needing to be judged. Right. You know, he, he's very much sin has been committed. We need to judge their sin and make things right. He is. Oh, go on. But in doing that, he misses the grace. I, I guess I would push back a little bit in the following way. He's rigid, but he doesn't have an ego. In fact, I, I think part of part of his pro, or part of Bartleby's problem is that he does it. Bartleby does have an ego. Loki does not. And and I I don't think it is particularly difficult for him. He 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 taught and, and I get it in that conversation where uh uh he, he talks about it as if it's hard work, right? Whereas Ben Affleck is is like uh what, what do you mean it's hard work? You just lit a few fires. And hey, there's an art to mass genocide. It's it's the most the most exhausting thing next to playing soccer, right? I mean, and just the ease right. with which he discusses it suggests that in fact it really isn't that difficult for him. And and he never and and and, and after he kills the 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 adulterer he walks off whose house my house but 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 the thing about loki is is that he doesn't have an ego it's 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 all just a job to him he 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 has a little bit of fun with it but it's all just a job with him but that's part of the reason why and although he's at first he seems the most violent of the pair that 
that's why he's not the most violent of the pair. It doesn't end up being the most violent of the pair. In yeah. fact, um, he stands up to Bartleby at the end. Yeah. And I would argue finds he, the same kind of redemption that Bartleby does. Yeah, he's not the one that gets drunk. He he doesn't get into the drunken bloodlust is what I call it. Mm-hmm. You know, where it's just, drunk. yeah, well, yeah. But but this, um, there there's almost this, when I think, think of that term bloodlust, it's like you just get to this point where, that's all you can think about and all you can live for is is committing murder and seeing blood spilled um and and sadly i think that's part of what happens sometimes in some of these um shooting situations that we've been dealing with recently mm. and and previously is that there's just this place for violence and blood and um he definitely kind of gets to that point where he's just killing for the sake of of killing um in the midst of that so yeah definitely um an interesting pairing between bartleby and loki versus jay and and silent bob and and definitely like the 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 thing i think about with silent bob too is that part where someone is messing with jay and you it kind of focuses in on silent bob and he gets this like oh don't you mess with him and he 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 kind of like pulls out all the stops at that point and then the and then he sprays the the smelling spray on the crap demon <laughs> that he has because he's dealt with jay's farts <laughs> so yeah. much which, which speaks to uh, his inability to take Jay's bullshit, right? Mm. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, we didn't list that in our, in our conversations about some of the different characters. We need to talk about the Golgoth and shit demon. <laughs> we need to get He's, there eventually. <laughs> he, he, the, the, the line that the muse has, which makes fun of gamer culture so well. He's an excremental, which speaks to elemental, right? Because in, in gamer culture, there's elemental uh beings and such just like he's an yeah. excremental what a shit demon <laughs> that, that line <laughs> yeah but you know. and, and that, that that is bob who saves the day right because he doesn't take bullshit right mm-hmm. knocks out strong odors <laughs> without without much violence he just he just sprays yeah and and you know for me one of the one of the elements that is I guess falls into the problematic character category as I'm thinking about this with Jay and Silent Bob is, you know, yes, they have a role, but do they really, does, does Bethany really need someone to accompany her to complete her mission? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think Bob contributes, um, but no, I, 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 I don't think Jay contributes terribly much to the Enterprise at all. They're just sort of there for, for comic relief. Mm-hmm. And, and you're right that Silent Bob does point out the article that points them to the final piece of the puzzle to talk to um, Jay Cardinal does. Glick. <laughs> oh, by the way, speaking of Cardinal Glick. Yeah. Let's, my let's favorite talk about character. Him. My absolute favorite character. Played by the late George Carlin. May he rest in peace. Absolutely. One of the best comedians ever. And we're doing one of his comedy specials on this show. Yeah. So there's an irony of casting George Carlin as a cardinal. He was a militant atheist. Yeah. And and I, I some of his one-liners in this movie are, are both humorous and somewhat telling. Like, um, the Catholic Church does not make mistakes. My favorite line ever delivered well probably my third favorite line ever delivered uh in all of cinema behind we're the roman catholic church we can do whatever we want which is delivered by jeremy irons in the film casanova and you can't fight in here this is the war room delivered in uh uh dr strangelove but yeah no the, the, we're the the, the 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 please the catholic church doesn't make mistakes and the way he 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 presents catholicism in, in two ways is just so hilarious uh first off because uh, and we'll get to Catholicism, wow, and the buddy Jesus. But but first off, this notion of of of, of being like a drug pusher, <laughs> we gotta get them where, when they're Look young. Them while they're young, and then, yeah. and then so you're like the tobacco. Oh, if industry. only we had their numbers. Yes. 
<laughs> that is that that is just so and, and it's such it's 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 quintessential George Carlin because it expresses uh, George Carlin is playing in that role exactly the kind of Catholic that George Carlin believes the Catholic Church is right he's he, he's mm-hmm. just living into it i mean he's he's expressing his own ideology although he would deny that he has an ideology he's wrong about that but he would deny it um and yeah and and uh the, the the other piece to George Carlin that that I that George Carlin's character is is that he, he he's behind the Catholicism Wow campaign and the Buddy Jesus or the Buddy Christ. Yeah, and so um, it's kind of hard to describe Buddy Jesus by audio, but um, it it it's kind of this Jesus that's got kind of a wink and he's got his finger guns pointing at you, kind of like a there you go, a hey, Fonzie, a hey. yeah. And, and, and for me, the, the underlying thing is, you know, he says, for example, let's look at the, the crucifix, this tired old sigil, you know, and he's like, I'll I'll be a classic or, you know, but, uh, but he says, we're going to update it and bring it to today. And, um, and the sad thing is, there is a lot of buddy Jesus theology out there. You know, and 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 to me, it bugs the crap out of me it's in some this, ways. If it's not nuanced, it's this endless search for relevance in the church. Mm-hmm. That the church is seeking after relevance, and and relevance becomes a kind of idol, as if we didn't really have faith that there is an eternal truth in the doctrine of the Word made flesh. And if we believe that there is truth inherent in the doctrine of the word may flesh, then we have no need to seek after relevance because that's always relevant. It, it's, it's by definition incapable of not being relevant. But, but as I think you were hinting at, without nuance, your, your statement without nuance, there is a kind of truth behind Buddy Jesus theology in, in the following sense, that Jesus is our friend. Um, Jesus does love us, and 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 even um, I, I think the Apostle Rufus, uh, not a real apostle, but the in the film, the Apostle Rufus expresses perhaps a better version of Buddy Jesus theology. Mm. In that, when he would describe how um, uh, whenever the apostles would talk about useless minutia like fishing and that sort of thing, Jesus would sit back and smile. Jesus, mm. as God and God in God's self, delights. Mm in creatureliness mm-hmm. and delights in, in, in when, when human beings are human beings. And we, don't, we don't just have to be at church all the damn time. Uh, we, can, we, we, we can be at church while we're fishing or playing ba- baseball or, or watching a good movie, you know, that mm-hmm. Jesus delights in these things. And in that sense, there is a great truth in the Buddy Jesus theology. But the problem with Buddy Jesus is, one, it's seeking after a relevance that the church doesn't need to seek after. Right, we're we're afraid of losing our sense of relative of relevance. Stop it! That's idolatrous. And two, it 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 has a habit of um, of of saying yes to power and not speaking truth to power, not speaking mm-hmm. prophetic truth to power. The the the, the purveyors, buddy, Jesus theology that I see are people like Joel Osteen. Yeah, or Jesus like is my Rick friend Warren. because he supports what I believe rather than a true friend is the one who calls you on your bullshit. Yes. And who holds you accountable and says, dude, what do you, what are you doing? Yes. Yeah. That is, that is a true friend. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of friend. If, if Jesus is our friend, that's the kind of friend Jesus is. Yes. The, the, the message, and, and I, I feel like the, the left-wing church is a little unfair to Joel Osteen in the sense that we accuse him of being a peddler of prosperity theology. He's not a peddler of prosperity theology. He's a peddler of buddy Jesus theology. He's a peddler of the theology that Jesus wants you to live your best self, when actually, no, Jesus wants you to imitate him it's not about you. <laughs> um, yeah. Jesus isn't there to affirm you in, in Jesus is there to proclaim Shape the us truth. in God's image. Yes. So, yeah. So, and then the other thing that I think when I think of Cardinal Glick kind of quintessential is him playing for, for one blessing his golf clubs 
an exact an exact expression of that buddy Jesus theology, by yeah. the way. And then two, golfing into the sacred chalice. Oh, we can <laughs> you know, get into that. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, to me, that is someone who has spent too much time with the holy, and therefore they have lost the sense of the sacred. You know, when when you get so blasé about holding sacred objects as sacred. We talked a, a little bit about this in our preparatory conversation of this, this notion. There's a tension in progressive theology, especially to want to deconstruct the distinction between sacredness and um, mundaneness, right? To suggest that the mundane is holy, and I think it is. Um, and I certainly empathize with that, that tendency. However, um, there's a sense in which if we lose sight of the, the distinction between sacredness and, 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 and mundaneness, we're also missing something there too. I mean, what does the term holy mean? I mean, etymologically, it means set apart, other, right? Recognizing yeah. that we're encountering something that is different from our mundane usual experience. And it's only when we can when we start from, we begin from that starting point that we're encountering something different and new that we can begin to develop the eyes of faith to see, oh yeah, it's really not that new. It's, it's all around me. I just couldn't, didn't perceive it at first. I was so caught up in the mundane that I forgot that the mundane is holy. Yeah. And of course, it does come through. The Buddy Jesus theology comes through. It allows Silent Bob to kill Azrael with the golf club. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, okay, so now let's let's talk about Azrael. Again, I think of these characters in pairings of like one versus the other. They kind of balance in parallel. And so for me, the next two that I think about in parallel are Serendipity, the muse, and Azrael, who is a fucking demon mm. <laughs> but was a previous a fucking demon uh, and 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 i'm quoting here so you know um but yeah, and but he was also previously a muse mm -hmm. and what for me um we'll get into some of the parallels but i want to start with Azrael. for me what really convicts me about the character of Azrael is he is kicked out because he remained neutral, waiting to see how things would come, instead of taking a side in the battle of good versus evil and, and all of that. And, and he says, but I was an artist. You know, he, he's like, I don't, I don't really want to get into all of this. And so for me, that brings up the conversation around, um, you know, it, it, neutrality in times where you can no longer be neutral. Well, is uh, is not taking aside just another word for having faith? I mean, the and and indeed, it, it, it as as you were saying that, I was thinking of what uh, Bartleby said to Loki as Bartleby killed Loki, right? I'm sorry, my friend, but you lost the faith. And and it's interesting because what Bartleby was doing or what Loki was doing at that time was expressing a great deal of faith and standing up to Bartleby, but he lost the faith. He he. In other words, the the synonym for 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 that statement is he chose the wrong side or he defected. Right. He he left that side and went right. to the other side. Um, to have faith by by its very definition is to choose a side, right? Um, and it's to do so in the absence of uh, reasonable or in the absence of a lack of reasonable doubt, right? Um, uh, my faith in God is not beyond reasonable doubt by, by any stretch. And, 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 and indeed, I think what, what Azrael expresses is um, he, he remained neutral because he wasn't sure who was going to come out on top. And um, I'm not sure if it was a question of he wasn't sure who was right, but um, let's let's That's let's fair. Let's, let's let's enter that into the conversation. He wasn't sure who was right. He wanted to remain neutral because he had his doubts. Right. Well, all of the characters have their doubts. Right. As we've said on this podcast many times, doubt and faith walk the same uh, walk hand in hand. But to have faith is to act and to take a side in the face of doubt, whereas um, 
uh, Azrael is, I think, the pure atheist, the fool who says in his heart, there is no God, in the sense of he, because of his doubts, just remains neutral. And what Elie Wiesel would say is, is that if you remain neutral, you're on the side of the oppressor. Right. And, and, and so he gets to this point where he would prefer non-existence to what he is, to hell, to where he's at. Well, that um, makes two of us. Yeah. Well, and uh, anyway, so compare that then with the character of, of serendipity. Um, she is a muse. And what is so ironic about her character is she leaves heaven, but not as a matter of lacking faith. Rather, it's a, I can do, I want to do this for myself. I want to create for me. And, and the irony is, when writer's she gets block. she gets writer's block yeah and so um you know she can she can help anyone else create and do all that and and to me what a perfect example of how spiritual gifts work right like too often we think about this as something for me i can do it i'm good at it and i get i like it when paul every time he lists the spiritual gifts it's not about your own boasting it is he explicitly says god gives us the spirit gives us gifts for the benefit of the community. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, a couple of things. First off, uh, as you were saying that, it, it sort of reminds me of what the Sadducees say about Jesus as he's on the cross. He saved others. Let him save himself. And I think what uh, 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 what serendipity is sort of forced to learn is, is, the, is what Jesus knew all along as he was dying on the cross. This is not about me. Right. Um, of course, serendipity's relationship to God is is interesting. It's never antagonistic. Um, serendipity leaves heaven, but I don't give the impression that it was an angry. I'm, you know, walking away no. out of a sense of like I hate you. It's just a, oh, I'd like to go and try this out. And God says, "All right, knock yourself yeah. out, have fun." Yeah. Uh, so I agree. And then the other thing about serendipity is the conversation around. Um, you know, with, with that conversation of inspiration, you know, we have this idea of what does it mean that scripture was inspired by God? Um, and, and, and also, you know, they get into the conversation around who actually wrote the words of the Bible. And she says, you know, the, the, the pen holders were all men. And, and to me, that's, that was really where I started in my own faith journey, when I very first time I saw that and I, and I heard that I was kind of like, you know, yeah, that's right. Where, where were the women and where have that? And so, you know, it gets me thinking about the lenses and who shapes the image, who frames the picture. Yeah. Rufus and serendipity really, I think, express liberation theology quite well. In, 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 and they express the, the hermeneutic of suspicion, that aspect of, of liberation theology that is faithful to the Bible, but at the same time is willing to apply a sense of suspicion to the Bible and where it comes from. Like where and, and how the dynamics of, of power um, play out in how the Bible is written. Um, you know, how do we see the fact that in many cases, the Bible is written by powerful, wealthy people um, and, and perhaps in spite of themselves expressing a, um, exclu an exclusive and, and oppressive ideology that, that is antithetical to, to the actual gospel. I mean, I see Rufus and serendipity as very faithful Christians, quote unquote, but uh, and, and very faithful and, and affirming of the Bible, but at the same time, they're very honest in the fact that they have problems with the Bible and how it is interpreted and how it has been written. Yeah. So I, I th and that was one thing I wrestled with when I was in seminary was this concept of the inerrancy of scripture and the way that I've kind of, I, 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 I could probably put more nuance than I do, but I think what I've come down to if there is error in scripture, it is through the humanity that has transmitted it. Yeah, I, I guess for me, if there is quote unquote error in scripture, it's 
it's a feature, not a bug. Mm. I, I wonder if God, I mean, because, and, and this gets into this notion of, I mean, the whole point of the film is, is we can't prove God to be um, fallible. But God doesn't operate according to our understandings of logical coherence. I mean, mm-hmm. I agree, God is infallible, God is, is inerrant, but if I try to say that what infallibility means is perfect logical consistency in the way I understand perfect logical consistency, well, then I'm putting a human standard on God. Yeah. I'm going to pull Karl Barth and say, God is wholly other. There is no natural point of contact between God and humanity. The point of contact is, is Jesus. And therein lies the um, omnis of God, the omnibenevolence of God, the omni, the omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God, the, the perfection and infallibility of God lies in the fact that God is fully other. In the very fact that God does not obey the, the rules of logic that philosophers like to use to pin him down, her down. And the other thing I would say to that is, um, oh, heavens, my train got derailed. Go on, talk. I, I, I've been talking. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to take it in a different direction. So now that we're talking about God, um, you know, it, 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 it really strikes me that the ending of the movie is literally a deus ex machina. Pray continue. <laughs> yeah. So um, the term deus ex machina refers to Greek tragedy and comedy where the ending was resolved by god out of the machine right where where literally you have the situation things are going on and the only way you're going to get a resolution is god coming in and saving the day or a, a god right in their case and so here we have this situation where john doe jersey is in a coma because god's a skee-ball fanatic and part of the plot is keeping God out of the way because by keeping God alive so that God can't return to heaven, but not, um, you know, and so part of the whole thing is Bethany goes and unplugs God <laughs> from the machine. <laughs> it creates euthanasia or does euthanasia in order to save the day, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and then God comes back as Alanis Morissette. <laughs> You know, uh, which is a, uh, you know, that can be a whole conversation we can have as well. Um, And I guess, you know, another question that I have is, had they not had the conversation about God being she, would God have appeared as Alanis Morissette? Uh, Yeah, uh, I I agree. Um, And well, of course, Rufus himself says, you know, he's not, she's not really a she, she's not really anything, right? Yeah, exactly. but but my read on God's the day of sex machina, of God coming into the into the to, to the fray and saving the day, is that um, God, and, and and this is perhaps a, a bit of an unusual read on the film. Uh, I don't necessarily read the film in the way that a lot of folks read the film. It, it, I think God a- appears and demonstrates that there was never really a problem to begin with. Mm, <laughs> that yeah. the problem, uh, and, and it's interesting. God never says that if they walk through this uh, this archway and obtain plenary indulgence. Oh, by the way, the film gets that doctrine wrong, and we can get into that. But God never says if they walk through that doorway, obtain plenary indulgences, become forgiven. I am therefore proved infall or not infallible, and 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 creation is unmade. The Metatron says that, and I think the Metatron's wrong. Um, and it because because. What happens at the end? Bartleby is received by God. The very thing that they were afraid of happening happens, and it was all okay. God shows up and demonstrates, you were worried about nothing. I've had this all along. And therein lies the infallibility that is not, in principle, disprovable. So let's talk about God and Metatron, right? So the whole idea is that, you know, human, God can't, speak with god's voice to humanity or or humanity would be um destroyed by hearing it and in fact that's kind of one of the plot point that's how one of the characters has gotten rid of Hmm. is he's become human and so therefore god's voice you know anyone who isn't dead or on another plane of existence (laughs) would do well to cover their ears now (laughs) you know um but 
it, so the Metatron has to be the voice for God. Mm. And, you know, and 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 to me, even that concept itself is fascinating. You know, being you know, what would it be like to be the mouthpiece, the voice of God? I guess we'd have to ask Jesus. Yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus is mm-hmm. the language by which God create speaks to the world. Jesus is the Metatron. Yeah. Well, and that's I guess that's the other thing that I find fascinating. Right? Is there's that tension where speaking would destroy humanity and yet i think of speaking the god's voice as being creative right you know so there's that it, there's I, I just realized there's an interesting tension there um but then the other piece is i like the fact that the two don't always agree with each other mm. you know I, I like that metatron has that very tender moment of saying you know i wish i could do it differently i i this isn't fair i wouldn't do it this way Metatron is not God. Metatron mm-hmm. is a creature. Yeah. Metatron as a creature, even though he has a very intimate relationship with God, is still very, very fallible. Mm-hmm. And and then, you know, there's that part where um, God rolls God's eyes at Metatron for, you know, the, I, I just love that part where he's like, where, where she's like, ah, you messed it up again. Let me, okay, got it. <laughs> Well, and, and Metatron is, is uh, there's the, that line after God fixes everything and intentionally leaves a spot on Metatron's suit. And he's like, you missed, you a, missed spot. a spot. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, and, and by the way, yes, so let's talk about Metatron being played by the fabulous late Alan Rickman and just and how. Page um, 394. So I, 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 I think he his his wit his compassion um you know he he's a he he he's in the truest sense of what an angel is you know he's he's very much that because you know i think sometimes we have this bright cheery happy image of an angel and he's he's not the like utterly terrifying image but he also demonstrates this concept that Wesley is often um, you, he uses a lot. And I've kind of adopted that nice is different than good, mm. you know, where he's, he's good. He's not always nice. Mm. He has some nice moments at times, but he's kind. I, yeah. I, I, if I could amend Wesley's dictum, which I agree, uh, of course, it, yeah, which I agree with, I would say perhaps uh, 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 another way of putting it also might be uh, kind is different than nice. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so then we have Rufus. <laughs> and, and we've talked a little bit about Rufus, but um, left out of the Bible because he was black is the, is what is said of, you know, um, He's James Cone. Yeah. You, you know the, theolo- he, the theologian James Clone? The yeah, Cone, I know James black, Cone, but go ahead and say. Theologian. Yeah. Well, see. <clears throat> James Cone argues that Jesus is black. Mm-hmm. Now, as I understand the argument, and if, if there are any um, fans of James Cone out there, and of course I like James Cone, but if there are any fans of I James Cone out there who would like to correct me, by all means do so. Uh, James Cone is talking about the Christ of faith when he says that. He's not talking about the historical Jesus. The historical Jesus uh, existed at a time when the categories of blackness and whiteness did not exist in the way we understand it. Jesus certainly mm-hmm. would have had dark skin. That much is true. Um, but Jesus is black in the sense that Jesus is always of the oppressor. And salvation or is of the oppressed. Sorry, not of the right. oppressor. Yeah, that, that's a heresy to say that Jesus is of the oppressor is a heresy. Jesus mm-hmm. is always of the oppressed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to say that blacks are oppressed is to say that Jesus is black and mm-hmm. to say that we find salvation in a black man. Um, yeah. and, and to say and that. He, and he talks about that, you know, he says, but but once they find out they're getting this good shit from a black man. <laughs> And yeah, we have to turn Jesus into a white man, into something mm-hmm. that he is not, in order yeah. to, in order to, which, which is a, a just such a case in point example of idolatry. Mm-hmm. We, we create God in our own image because we cannot face the truth that we are worshiping a black man. And yeah. that part of what salvation is, is coming to identify 
with blackness, to cast off whiteness and identify blackness. And that's what Cohn would say. Absolutely. I also just, I just kind of like how he comes about to in this, how he, he also kind of literally falls out of this, you know, people don't just, dead people don't just fall out of the sky, you know, and, boom. and then of course we get silent Jay's, Jay's next uh, phrase. After that. Yeah, yeah, which I'm not going to go into, but it's, it's slightly humorous. It's bad humor, but still humorous. Yeah, they're so. def- the, the ways in which the film gives offense, I, I would like to sit down with a fundamentalist Christian without you know, having a discussion or a debate over the, our differences in theology, but watch the film with them and then turn to them and say afterwards, all right, what offended you? And then have them turn to me afterwards and say, all right, what offended you? Yeah. And have a conversation for why we take offense, what we take offense at. Mm-hmm. And and I'm going to guess when you do that, you find a lot. So I had a professor one time who said, if you want to know where someone, what their beliefs are, you know, ask what's at stake, ask mm. what they're afraid of. And so similarly, the idea of what people take offense at is a similar idea, right? You know, what are the things that we hold so dear that we can't poke at that because it's a sensitive spot? It seems to me that what... Um progressive, um, <coughs> excuse me, it seems to me that what progressives uh, and progressive Christians um, tend to be offended by um, is not so much um, vulgarity or obscenity as such, right? I mean, it, it, I, I don't have a problem with bad language, so, so described, so-called. I don't really have a problem with uh, taking concepts that I, I, I might find to be sacred and mm, making fun of them. Um, to me, that's what the prophets do. Um, and uh, what, what, what offends me is, is when um, traditionally oppressed communities are, are hurt. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's interesting, I, I, I find that so often when, um, when con- conservative Christians take offense at something, they're taking offense at what I would regard and, and I, this is sounding self-righteous of me because I, it is. It, it, it's, I, I haven't really seen it from their perspective, so I'm seeing it from my perspective, and we can deconstruct that as we'd like. But it, it, it seems to me that what they're offended by is, um, well, what I would consider service matters, what it looks like. That's fair. Yeah, I mean, if everything appears good, looks good, then they're good. Well, yeah, being it's that ang- concept of whitewashed tombs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sure that if, and, and I kind of wish that I could sit down with a fundamentalist for this conversation. Yeah, I think there would be some interesting points of contact. Yeah, so, so tell me, a fundamentalist, how are you not a whitewashed tomb? <laughs> that, that, that'd be an interesting question to ask them. Yeah, so, and um, the, the concept of a whitewashed tomb for our listener is in the Bible, Jesus often accuses the Pharisees in the scriptures of being whitewashed tombs tombs were unclean and so what he's saying is you look good on the outside but on the inside you're rotten to the core Mm. no and so he's he's calling that out and 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 you know you talked about this idea of language um you know that we're not offended by bad language and that makes me think of that def- the thing I always say about the commandment of not taking the Lord's name in vain. It's not about not swearing. What it's about is using the name of God to further your own agenda. Well, it, it's about using the name of God in injustice. And in, yeah. Um, yeah uh, what I, it's not I'm, not, I'm not not offended by bad language because I don't think bad language is just language and therefore of no matter. Um, I, I'm not a, not offended by bad language because I think that bad language in and of itself is a prophetic tool. And it, when it is used correctly, it's it's used for prophetic purposes. As I said in an episode of Blessed Lunatics, they're not bad words, they're wonderful words. And that's precisely why they should be used sparingly. Because as with all language, they have the they have tremendous creative and destructive p- potential. And when used uh, against historically oppressed communities, they can be very destructive. And when used to punch up, they can be very creative. Agreed. 
So if you were to uh, write a sermon on this, uh, what, what would the takeaway be for the congregation? You know, I think what I would um, what what I would go with is talking about this idea of being too rigid with doctrine. You know, I would look at those times where Jesus says, you know, you've heard it said this, but I say this, where he gets it really the the underlying, you know, we can have rules, but Jesus understood the meaning underneath them. You know, he understood the truths that they were pointing to. And so, um, you know, being being OK with recognizing that there's there's going to be times in your life where you're not going to understand it all and that that's OK, that's normal, um, that it's OK to be angry with God, to wrestle with God, um, kind of a Job moment kind of thing. Um, I think that's the direction I would probably go with it. Yeah, and I, I think I'd go in a similar direction in the sense that I would like to talk a lot about Bethany and Bartleby's journey. Um, in the, you, your, um, your end point, I think, would be my starting point, um, which is not to say that one of us is doing it right and the other wrong. I think it both would make for excellent sermons. Uh, but I, I would like to talk about the process of, uh, of going from anger with God into a resolution the the process sure. of going the phrase that 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 comes out of the psalms that i keep coming back to is sing a new song to the lord and the meaning that i find in that phrase is the old songs don't work anymore that we've come to a yeah. new orientation we've come to a new a sense of our relationship with god which is back to a sense of it being positive and and mm-hmm. but but on the other hand it's a new kind of positivity that take in the negativity that we've experienced yeah. And it, it's it's more mature. And so as a result, we can no longer sing the old naive hymns. We have to sing a new song to the Lord. And mm-hmm. I guess I would title the sermon, Sing a New Song to the Lord, the uh, experience of Bartleby and, uh, and, and Bethany. So. Mm-hmm. so what is our next movie? I have no idea. Do you? <laughs> ah, I know we looked this up. No, it's, it's we don't know yet. We really don't because oh, that's uh, right, that's uh, right. We don't know. It's Wesley's turn, yeah. and he hasn't so picked Wesley one yet. So Wesley, edit Wesley, edit all of this out and pick. No, a movie. don't don't edit this out. We're going to use this turn this time to, to to tell you to pick a darn movie. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, folks. So our next movie is another of my childhood favorites because Dogma was one of my childhood favorites that was often a double feature with Saved. So there was. Dogma saved. And then one of my other childhood favorites was American President, which is our next movie. So, well, um, we are so grateful for all of you who have been part of this conversation today about the movie Dogma. Um, We think we could not do what we do without those of you who listen in, who engage with us in conversations in various ways, who share the, the podcasts with those that you know and care about. Um, So we are truly thankful for you who have joined us today. We invite you to continue joining us through our newfaithnewmedia.net website and its discussion forums. Um, You also have opportunities to give as you are able financially, either through buy me a coffee or by becoming a patron on our Patreon account. I always get those words confused, but um, so we are Again, we are so thankful for all of you. We are thankful to our editor, Wesley, who makes us sound far more incredible than we actually are, or at least I am. And and we also are grateful for Gail Gallagher, who does music, and for suggesting this great movie for us to talk about today. So thank you for joining us, and we will see you again the next time a pastor and a priest walk into a movie theater. I told you she was funny.